just after dawn on a spring day. The woods and fields are full of birdsong. Joyful, romantic, it's certainly the most musical sound in nature. But birdsong is also swearing and squabbling and being downright selfish. For birdsong, for all its beauty, is to these birds a matter of survival. Of course, a lot of noises birds make can scarcely qualify as song. And a lot of birds simply don't sing at all. But in true songbirds, like the wood thrush, the house wren, and the white-throated sparrow, song provides a vital communication link between members of a species. Every species sings a different song. Some species, like the song sparrow, sing many songs. In this bird, maybe a dozen. In other species, as many as a thousand. Some, like the red-winged blackbird, sing only one or two. But in almost all species, it's only the male that sings. Songs can sound simple, but just listen to this wood thrush song slowed down to one quarter of its normal speed. A hundred years ago, scientists' main interest in birdsong was to help them find the birds. But when they found them, scientific study consisted mainly of collecting them, skinning them, classifying them, and giving them long Latin names. As for birds in nature, they interested only bird watchers, who were concerned more with spotting birds to add to lists rather than really watching and listening to see how birds live their lives. But since the 1930s, another way of looking at birds has emerged, a more scientific way. Professor William Dilger. One can study behavior objectively, scientifically, measure things, get data that can be treated statistically, find out a great deal about how these animals fit into their environment, make a living, avoid being prey and how they become predators and how they reproduce and how they communicate with one another. Communicating with one another is what a lot of animal behavior is all about. One person who watched birds carefully and objectively in the hope of learning to eavesdrop on their conversations is Bill Dilger, now professor of biology at Cornell University. First thing I had to uh, learn to do as far as animal behavior was concerned was to learn to see to see the little things that they do that are perhaps insignificant at first to us, but are of enormous significance to them. So I found that uh, the fact that I'd been interested in, in illustrating animals uh, for many years had sharpened my, uh, sort of pre-adapted me, so to speak, to pay attention, to learn to see. But eyes and ears have to be on the lookout for the right messages. But it's not very difficult to see obvious things animals do. Uh, uh, very spectacular displays, or hear the sounds they make if they're loud enough. A lot animals do, which is of great significance among themselves, may be exceedingly subtle to us. It may just involve slight changes of eye shape, or slight tilting of the head up or down or sideways, or slight movements of the tail or wings, uh, adjustments, fine adjustments of the plumage. All of these things are, are extreme importance to them and we have to learn to see that kind of thing. So what is important for a bird? Well, knowing and proclaiming what species it is for a start. The basic message of the red-winged blackbird song is simply, I'm a red-winged blackbird. Or of a wood thrush, I'm a wood thrush. Or of a white-throated sparrow, I'm a white-throated sparrow. Why does he proclaim his identity so loudly? One reason is to help attract a mate of the right species.
and the song does something else too. It helps in the real estate market, in claiming and keeping a piece of land. Professor Douglas Smith. In an evolutionary sense, the problem that the, uh, these birds face is to provide a place where their nestlings can successfully be raised. And one of the main resources that they have to worry about is food availability, and that's one of the, one of the reasons why many species of birds set up territories. Here's a male red-winged blackbird sitting on a cattail in a marsh. And 20 feet away, there's another male red wing. Between the two of them is an invisible boundary. When he arrives in the spring from his winter migration, each male sets about carving himself a piece of property from the open marsh. The choicest sections are those with good nesting sites and plenty of food for the young. To establish a territory, each male finds some high perches and claims his land by singing and displaying his plumage to his rivals. As other males come in, they too start singing and displaying to claim some land. The boundaries fluctuate back and forth. But soon, through these confrontations, they become fixed, and the whole area is subdivided into territories. The males then spend much of their time fending off intruders, males who haven't been successful in staking out a territory of their own. The point of the singing and displaying is to substitute for actual physical combat. And that pecking at the ground isn't feeding. It's thwarted aggression redirected elsewhere, like banging your fist on the wall when you're angry. Territory established and battles won, the male can go about feeding himself and waiting for the females. He might even relax enough to cover his epaulets when no intruders are around. When the female red wings do arrive, drab and untuneful, each one settles down with a territorial male. His song and display more an attraction now than a threat and the business of raising and feeding a hungry and a demanding family begins, the female now doing most of the work. Red-winged blackbirds are not the only species that inhabit this field. There are song sparrows, chipping sparrows nesting here, wide-eyed vireos nesting in the trees along the edge, uh, catbirds, mockingbirds, there's quite a list of uh, species that, that coexist with red wings on this piece of land. And these different species will only respond to their own species song. Uh, a yellow warbler will respond to its own song. A catbird will respond to its own song. A red wing will respond to a red wing song. But a catbird will not respond to a yellow warbler song. They, in fact, over here, we just heard a yellow warbler singing. In fact, here it comes just flew up above it. Yellow warblers and red-winged blackbirds ignore each other's song because they don't compete for the same food for the young, the same nesting materials. So perhaps 20 or 30 different species of songbird can coexist in the same field, each species dividing it up into quite different overlapping territorial patterns. Just listening to bird song and watching carefully how a bird responds can tell you a lot. But to find out what song really means to a bird, you need some help from modern technology. It certainly makes a big difference having portable tape recorders. 
before they were introduced in the early 50s, people used to write notes to themselves about what they thought birds said. And of course, some people who had bulky disc equipment made some bird recordings. But until we had these tape recorders, and particularly the portable ones, we couldn't really experiment. You could guess what birds were communicating because you could see what they were doing when they sang. But the real test of communication is to play the song back and see that some other bird responds. Professor J. Bruce Falls of the University of Toronto first got the idea of playing birds their own songs during a walk through a wood when he hooted at an owl. The owl hooted back and followed Falls till he left the owl's territory. Falls wondered if territorial songbirds would respond in the same way to an artificial song. An instruction book for a playback experiment might read like this. First, string out the speaker wire so that the speaker can be put on a bird's territory. Be prepared to make the bird, in this experiment, a white-throated sparrow, rather cross while you're doing it. Next, return to your tape recorder, putting a suitable distance between yourself and the bird so you know it's not responding to you any longer. Insert a loop of tape on which you've already recorded a white throat song. Switch on the tape recorder to start the loop playing. Turn up the volume on the amplifier to very loud. And watch. seem to be birds singing on both sides here. There's one up there, and there's another one in the bushes over here. I think there's one coming from over in this direction. It's come up to the speaker now. Playing the song attracted the resident bird to the speaker and provoked him into singing back at it. Whenever Falls did the experiment, he saw the same response. The bird seemed to treat the sound coming from the speaker as if it were the song of an intruding male trying to take over the territory. Falls has been doing playback experiments now for some 20 years. And as long as he played the right song to the right species, the bird always reacted in the same way. sometimes more dramatically than at others. Well, I've never had a bird come in this close when I've been right here before. Sometimes they come to the speaker, but I've never had them come when I'm right beside the speaker. That's very unusual. This is a very bright colored bird and a very highly responsive one. The bird wants to attack the speaker, but he's a bit afraid of me, so instead he pecks around on the ground. <laughs> 